Let's ruin your Boxing Day by talking about a sugar tax. Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of Heiser Says. I'd like to talk about a sugar tax because one's, I think, just appeared in the UK and there's talk of bringing one into Australia. Now, I'll just jump here to look at this map that shows you where all the sugar taxes are around the world at the moment. You can see here we've got, look at all the countries that have sugar tax. You know, a lot of Europe, some Pacific Islands, you know, what's number six? Dominican Republic, Barbados, and seven cities in the United States. San Francisco, of course. Berkeley, of course. So, does it actually work? Does it make a difference? Or is it just essentially a sin tax that will hurt the poor people? Sugar is in everything that's processed, pretty much. If you want to try and remove sugar from your diet, it can be really hard. It can be quite shocking as well when you figure out how much sugar is in all the food you eat. My wife and I did it and she had migraines for five days because she gave up sugar. I would highly recommend that people give it up. I think it's it's a drug. It's not good for you. It is not healthy. But let's read this article that sugar taxes haven't proven effective in tackling obesity. Just like Taxes on cigarettes haven't really stopped cigarettes. There's still a lot of people smoking, a lot of poor people smoking. I have the theory that, you know, if you've got less wealth, you've got a stressful life, you're, you know, maybe living paycheck to paycheck, it's the little luxuries that you appreciate, you know, a little bit of happiness here and there, a chocolate bar here, a soft drink there, a couple of smokes. So you tax the hell out of it and you you tax that one little luxury that someone on the low socioeconomic scale of our civilization could afford. Because of reasons. So Malaysia Malaysia recently became the latest nation to call for a tax on sugary foods or drinks to tackle obesity. 4,000 miles away, a recent Senate inquiry into public health policy in Melbourne, Australia, Green Party Senator Richard uh, Donate, good old Richie Rich, quizzed me about the Australian Taxpayers Alliance research, which revealed that sugar taxes have failed to make any significant dent in obesity rates in the countries that have pursued them. I frankly believe it's because people are eating too much of a high-processed, high-carb diet, and I'm becoming a bloody keto evangelist every day the more of this stuff I read. Instead of engaging with the claims and evidence, the questioning took a different line. Denatal, I'll I'll just call him DN, asked me, public health lobby groups like the Australian Medical Association disagree with you. Are they wrong? Yeah, they are. They recommend a high-carbohydrate diet. Their research is out of date. These lobby groups are out of date. The Heart Foundation links saturated fat to heart disease. That has been proven to be incorrect. Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna, I don't need to link to these videos. If, if you want to know now, I'm going to do some videos on it later, but just go to Low Carb Down Under and just watch that. Look up their stuff and change your diet. And now we have fre- fresh evidence from the UK that indicates exactly that. The British sugar tax took effect in April this year after intense campaigning by advocates like multimillionaire celebrity chef Jamie Oliver, who claimed that it is moral and necessary to tackle the obesity problem. Well, if you've watched Jamie Oliver burst into tears because children eat garbage in the UK, but but see, that's the thing. British food has never been considered good. You know, it's I wouldn't consider it the same as continental food. It's like pies with all organs and things. It's probably quite healthy now that I'm thinking about it. But yeah, describing it, describing it as a tax out of love. Oh, oh boy. Oliver has previously called for a ban on using cartoon, ca- cartoon characters to advertise sugary food to children, despite using cartoon characters on his own TV shows and segments featuring recipes for high fat, high sugar, sugar chocolate brownies. Well, the high fat is good. That's really good. Back in April, uh, in April, 11% of British shoppers claimed that they would cease consuming sugary drinks if a sugar tax took effect. Since then, the figure has fallen to a paltry 1%. I can't really say I drink that many sugary drinks. I never even did before I went on all these diets. It was just, 
my biggest vice was the energy drinks at university. It would be the V and it would be the mother drinking those. I've got a picture of me back at university with like six cans of V on my desk that I just downed one after the other. Surprisingly, the number of people who said they will continue to buy sugary drinks also rose post-tax from 31% in February to 44% in June. Nielsen's sales figures also show that big brands like Coca-Cola and Red Bull grew substantially over the 12, 12 months preceding August 2018 by 7.6 and 9% respectively. UK figures sh- should come as no surprise. Multiple American states and five major countries, Denmark, France, Hungary, Mexico and Chile, have experimented with taxes on sugary drinks or sugar. Not one of them has seen a, a material impact on the rates of obesity, which continues to climb across the Western world. Well, yeah. I mean, you cut out sugar, fantastic. Sugary drinks, people just buy other crap. Guaranteed, they'll buy other stuff. It needs to come down to education. It really does. We need to get a better education system in place to teach people more about diet, to show that the food pyramid was completely wrong, to teach people about the hormonal way and theory behind gaining weight, not just a calorie deficit. This is, none of this is going to work. Um, okay. Soft drink consumption in France was 4.2% higher in 2015 than it was right before the tax was introduced. A significant increase even when adjusted for changes in France's population. Oh, I wonder what those changes were. Hmm. I wonder. In Mexico, Nielsen sales data showed that over a two-year period since the introduction of a sugar tax, soda consumption fell by 182 liters in the entire country. What? Hang on. Wait, just 182 liters with this tax with a population of 120 million dollars. That, okay, let's get my calculator tool here. 120, zero, zero, 120 million. No, sorry, I need, wait. No, I'm doing it the wrong way around. I've got to do 182 liters. Let me clear this. Should have prepared this beforehand, but this just shocked me. 120. 1.51 e to the negative six liters. You know, that's just insane. Someone's calling me here. I'm just going to turn off my chat. Okay, so that is insane. It really is. So (laughs) I'm still shocked at how little a difference that made over an entire population. Just think how much it would cost to implement that tax. How much extra paperwork and BS will be involved in implementing a tax like that and how much it would cost. So they literally have spent, I'd say, millions of dollars implementing this procedure, this bureaucratic BS. They probably got, The government's probably got it back, but the businesses that have to deal with it, I guarantee you haven't. They're not going to get a tax deduction because of this. It's going to hurt them. It's like the GST. You know, a small business owner, you've got to do all your paperwork every month, every month. So despite this, sugar tax lobbyists and activist groups were so eager to claim success that they announced the findings of a study claiming that the Mexican soft drink tax has caused a 12% reduction in consumption across the populace since it was implemented in June 2014, with a 17% reduction among low-income groups. So that's 1.56 liters to e, e to the power, negative, 16th power, negative 6th reduction per person. That doesn't make sense. The non-peer-reviewed study which was coincidentally overseen by one of the tax's strongest proponents and advisor to the Mexican gov- government, consisted of panel interviews with self-reported data. Glaringly, the study ignored actual sales figures. Wow. How can people take this stuff seriously? This I, I feel this is very similar to the government interventions uh, to try and mitigate climate change. You know, to offset a prediction for 100 years in the future, we don't know what technological advances we have, and we could mu- be much smarter with using our resources now to have better inco- uh, outcomes for quality of life for people these days. Oh, boy. But then, you know, they're lobby groups. This is their job. This is their job. They don't have a real job. This isn't like a hobby. This isn't like me recording some videos, you know, now and then for a bit of fun. This is their job. So they have a complete bias to this. Could you imagine if that was your job and that was all the impact you made? Bugger all. 
It's a bit depressing. Finally, in 2016, the Me Mexican government claimed that sales figures had to be adjusted against hypothetical figures of what they would have been without the tax. In other words, using unverifiable assumptions to set a hypothetical scenario. Oh, boy. That lets them claim victory no matter what the real results were. That That's hilarious. That is utterly hilarious. Clearly, uh, burning one's head in, burying one he one's head in the sand makes more sense than admitting defeat. We now know that the soft drink industry in Mexico has rebound, rebounded, sorry, and the regressive tax has only served to take money out of the pockets of poorer Mexicans in line with to line the state's coffers. So much for a tax out of love. Yeah, it's just insane. We need education. We need to tell people to eat more saturated fat, to stop eating sugar, to teach them that sugar is processed similarly to alcohol in your body. You can pickle your liver with sugar. That's what we need to teach them, not putting a bloody tax on them. Stupid governments. This isn't the first time that junk science has been employed to defend sugar taxes. Chile added a modest tax of approximately 5 cents to every 500 milliliter can or bottle of sugary drinks in 2014. Researchers admitted that the data showed no significant actual impact in reduced soda consumption, yet they still concluded that the minuscule tax increase had caused a staggering 21.7% drop in soda sales based upon assumptions and modeling that are not disclosed in their paper. So, BS. It's just propaganda. Again. But obesity rates continue to climb. Yes, because of our high-carb, high-processed diet that we're eating in the West. Despite an actual decrease in sugar consumption, it's driven in part by the emergence of diet and zero-sugar alternatives and reformulation of products to lower sugar content in response to demands from health-conscious health consumers. We know it is perfectly possible to consume sugar as part of a balanced diet, and that sugar has no impact on weight gain if the individual burns more calories than they consume. Well, see, this is the calorie deficit model there. That is out of date. I wouldn't agree with that. It ha it's a very simplistic understanding of the human body and how it processes food. No, sorry, you're wrong there, mate. Perversely, we also know that taxing sugary food and drink only pushes comfort food seekers to non-sugary alternatives that are just as bad or worse, including savory fatty foods and alcoholic beverages. I think the alcoholic beverages are definitely worse. Fatty foods, if it's a saturated fat, if it was cooked in tallow or lard and not engineered seed oil, also known as vegetable oil, then it probably wouldn't be that bad. All sugar tax do is punish working consumers seeking to treat themselves some relief at the end of a long week. Yes, it does. But that isn't going to stop the international public health bureaucracy from demanding them. Okay, and this was done with, written by Seta Mara, a young voice contributor to the Director of Policy at the Australian Taxpayers Alliance. Fantastic. So that was a great piece and well written. If you're interested in these type of things, I recommend that you look up the Australian Taxpayers Alliance. But let's also have a look at here. This is why the World Health Organization is pushing for these types of taxations. Because look at all the countries where uh, overweight in, there's overweight children under five years of age. Look at Australia, nearly ten percent, five to ten percent, uh, under five percent. Here we go. The states. Wow. Look here. Look at oh, Mongolia. So they think that a tax will limit this. I don't think it'll work. I think it's been proven not to work. It's just going to take away a treat from people. Guys, what do you think? Let me know in the comments. Do you eat a lot of sugar? Do you have a lot of soft drink? Or do you avoid it? You're just a water drinking teetotaler. God forbid they put a tax on coffee. Then, then we'd have a yellow vest ride here in Australia. I can guarantee you that. So guys, thank you for joining me for this episode. Have a lovely boxing day and I will see you tomorrow. Bye for now.